All right, you guys ready for Colossians? All right, let's pray, and we'll dive into Colossians chapter 4. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your miracle work of causing stony, dead hearts to hear the gospel, to believe the gospel, to to set our eyes upon Christ when we were uh, rebels running away from him. You acted, you sought us when we were far off, and you brought us back. Lord, I pray that as we consider this word today, that you would help us to um, do what it says, these instructions to pray for the preaching of your word, these instructions to uh, speak the truth with our neighbors as the occasions arise. Lord, I pray that you would do this for us and that, above all, you would be glorified. In your name we pray, amen. All right, please stand for the reading of God's word. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is God's word. You may be seated. The letter of Colossians is all about Paul reminding the church in Colossae of the gospel and encouraging them to walk in step with that gospel. He opens the the letter by thanking God that they understand the gospel. He goes into what the gospel is. Then he talks about beware falling into these vain philosophies, which are going to steer you away from the gospel. And then he talks about how this gospel is going to be lived out in your life if you're believing it. And now he is in this passage telling the people how they participate in the mission of the gospel, in sharing the gospel with the world around us that desperately needs us. In the beginning of this letter, Paul, like I said earlier, tells us what the gospel is, and it's important to come back to that to understand what we're talking about here. Colossians 1, 12 to 14 says, He has delivered us. From the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The gospel is that the Son, in mercy and grace, was sent to save sinners. And these sinners are enemies, enemies who are held captive and are willing participants even in this domain of darkness that he is talking about. He did this by paying for their sin and forgiving their sin through his bloodshed on the cross. That's how you get taken from the domain of darkness and, being, and are brought into the kingdom of his beloved son. And he did this by conquering sin, Satan, and death through rising from the dead. And this means that now, this is also part of the good news, this King, this Jesus who was crucified for your sin was, and was raised from the dead, he also ascended to the right hand of the Father where he rules as Lord. The gospel includes the statement that Christ is Lord. And this also, this description that Paul gives us, notice that it sets the stage with two opposing sides in a war, as it were. On the one side, there's the dominion of darkness, and on the other side, there's the kingdom of his beloved son. And the impact of the gospel is that God is delivering sinners like you and me from this domain and dominion of darkness, active participants in that darkness, by the way, and bringing them into the kingdom of his son. Now, I want to emphasize the kingdom aspect because that means there's a corporate reality to the gospel. The gospel is not that you just get a little flavor of Christianity in you and you're an individual that gets to do whatever you want to do. No, you're brought from one kingdom into another. This means if you have been delivered, you now have a new king. You have a new king. 
and you belong to a new people, and you now have new marching orders because this king has a mission, and his mission becomes our mission. And this gospel is part of that mission. And this gospel, this good news, is potent. It's not impotent. It makes waves in the world. And these waves aren't like a splash that just eventually whimpers out. These waves, history has shown, are like the constant waves bashing against the the shore, changing the world, sometimes large waves, sometimes just constant small waves. And the reason for that ongoing nature of this wave making is because our king lives. And he lives and moves, and he is active in this mission going forward. That's why it never stops. That's why the gospel keeps going out. And if we are his people, like I said, that means his mission is our mission. We're called to participate in bringing this gospel to the lost, to those captive to the dominion of darkness. And that's what Paul's instruction in our text is all about. He's talked about how the message impacts them, and now he's going to talk about how they're supposed to take that message out. So we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at three parts of his direction. The first part is pray and be watchful in thankfulness. The second is pray for those who preach the gospel. And the third is answer outsiders graciously with wisdom. So first, pray and be watchful in thankfulness. Paul starts out this section of the letter, this final section of the letter, by instructing us to be a people steadfast and watchful and thankful in prayer. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So what does it mean to continue steadfastly in prayer? Well, we read something very similar to this in one of Paul's other letters that might help us unpack what this means. And it doesn't make it any easier, okay? First Thessalonians says this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul seems to think that prayer is really important. There are not a lot of things that I do without ceasing, And the things that I do do without ceasing are really important. The only thing I can actually think of is breathing. Okay, what happens if you stop? Not good. I am steadfast in breathing. Paul is telling the church that prayer is to be as normal and constant to us as breathing. That means prayer ought to be our knee-jerk reaction in every situation. It means that it is to be our heart's disposition to pray and come to God when we wake up and when we go to bed. It, It means that prayer is the priority in every situation. It means it should be strange not to pray. But how do we do that? That seems like an a lot of prayer. I think we underestimate our abilities here. And I want to do explain that by Um, challenging you. Imagine how much more you would pray to the Lord if you started to pray with the same frequency you check your phone for notifications, okay? Have you ever looked at the stats on your phone? Have you ever done that? It is a frightening thing to think, where am I, what am I looking at besides this thing? When you go and unlock, even on a low use day, you might have a hundred times where you look, unlock the screen. Just unlock it. Maybe it's checking the time. Who knows? But that's how much attention it so easily gets looked at our phone. It's a, it can be a disturbing number how many times that happens. Praying ste- and I, I say that just to illustrate. Praying steadfastly isn't necessarily difficult. But what we need in order to do it is to believe prayer is important. We need to believe that prayer is important. Prayer to us might seem like a small thing, but prayer is incredibly powerful because it is the way we trust and rely on a big and sovereign God to do wonderful things in answer to our prayers. The world around us thinks prayer is just a mental exercise. It's like getting you to some sort of... um, 
I don't know, the nerv- there's like nirvana, there's like there's these different places of peace, mindfulness. The world thinks prayer is a mental exercise. But the word, God's word, says that God is personal and he hears our prayers and he actually answers them. Prayer at times might seem like you're sitting on your hands and not accomplishing anything, and I, but that's not what it is at all. It's reaching out to God for him to do the things you could never do. But if you think that it's just sitting on your hands, I could see why you would not be motivated to pray. But truly, there is nothing more powerful than the prayers of God's people because prayer is relying on God for what he can do and what can he not do. And this is why we're to bring our requests to God. This is why we're to pray and ask God for wisdom. This is why we're to pray to God and ask him to give us our daily bread. Not because prayer means nothing, but because God has ordained that he sovereignly accomplish his will and plans in the world through answering our our prayers. Our prayers are part of his plan. Listen to John Frame on this. He says this, God ordains that crops will grow but not without water and sun. He ordains that people will be saved, but ordinarily not without the teaching of the word. And he ordains that we will have everything we truly need, but not without prayer. If we understood the power of prayer, we, I believe, would pray steadfastly. One of the things I shared in the the spiritual disciplines class, which was on prayer that I taught, was that sometimes we can have a low view of prayer and we end up praying like hyper-Calvinists, okay? And I'm gonna explain that term a little bit here. So Calvinism, which, whatever you think about Calvinism, this is what it, it, this is what it teaches, okay? God is sovereignly in control over all things and nothing can thwart his plans. The reason I believe that is because the Bible teaches that. God ordains all things. Nothing can thwart his plans. He is going to fulfill his will. You can't, no one can stand in the way of what he is going to accomplish. That's straight out of the Bible. We could do chapter and verse all day long, okay? But hyper-Calvinism says, yeah, and that's why we don't need to evangelize. Yeah, and that's why I don't need to pray. Yeah, because God's going to accomplish his will anyways. Do you know what? Guaranteed, you will not find a lick of that in the Bible. What you find in the Bible is is plea after plea to pray. But people of God going on their knees, pleading with God, and God, God in his plan responding to them. So we ought to be a people who pray steadfastly and are watchful in our prayers with thanksgiving. But that brings up another question. What does it mean to be watchful with thanksgiving? It means that we not only pray steadfastly and with persistence, but we pray in such a way that we're alert, we're watchful for God to answer our prayers. Why? So we can offer thanksgiving. We pray anticipating that God will grant our request according to his will. Why? Because he's a good father, and his people honor him by anticipating that he will answer their prayers. How you pray says a lot about what you think of God as father. Luke eleven ten 10 to 13, Jesus says this. He says, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If, then, if, you, then, who, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do you realize that when God gives the Holy Spirit, he's giving himself. That's the greatest gift. If he's not going to withhold himself, what will he withhold from you that you need? We should pray knowing that our Father in heaven loves to answer our prayers. And we're we're being called here to be persistent and keep track of answered prayers so we can be a people who are overflowing with thanksgiving to God. So when we pray, when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we should pray in such a way that we're also watchful. 
We're watchful, looking for the ways that God is fulfilling this in part so that we can offer our thanksgiving to God. And I think that Paul probably has something like this in mind when he writes this this commendation to pray, because then he goes on immediately to tell the church to pray for those who are preaching the word, which brings me to the next direction that Paul gives us. Pray for those who preach the gospel. Paul says, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Remember what I said earlier, to be a Christian is to belong to a new kingdom with Jesus as your king. His mission becomes your mission. That means that the work of evangelism belongs to the whole body of Christ. Christ is the one rescuing people out of the domain of darkness, but he has chosen to do so through his body. But, this is important, each member doesn't have the same role. Each member doesn't have the same role, but everybody participates. Some of the members of Christ are like Paul. They were called to be apostles. Some are called to be evangelists. Some are called to be preaching pastors. Each of those particular roles has a very specific role for the public declaration, the public preaching of the gospel of Christ. And while not all members of the body of Christ have that public role, All are called to participate in that public role by praying that a door door would be opened for the word. Notice, notice that it didn't even matter that Paul is this amazing apostle who wrote most of the New Testament. He still needs the prayers of the saints in Colossae. He needs them to pray that a door would be opened. There are people who prayed for Paul whose name you don't know, that God intended that to be the the means through which the door was open and Paul was able to preach the word clearly. Why is that? Why is this, why is it needed, these prayers, are these prayers of the saints needed? It's because God wants the work of evangelism to be the work of the corporate body of Christ. Because it is the corporate body of Christ that glorifies God by its unity in declaring the gospel. So why is it that the church needs in particular to pray for a door to be open for the word? It's because the success of the gospel going out is not dependent upon Paul. It's dependent upon God. What is this door? What is this open door, by the way? We might think it means praying that Paul would have a breakthrough in his message preparations. We might think it means that Paul needs help getting access to people that need to hear the word. We might even think that it just literally means that the prison doors need to open so Paul can go out and preach. All of these might actually be reasons for praying for an open door for the word, but I think there's actually underneath all these things, an even deeper reason, an even deeper, deeper reason why we must pray for the door to be open to the word. And that's because when you are preaching the gospel, it is, it is a miracle of God's grace that people respond to it. It is a miracle of God's grace that people hear the gospel and believe. Every single time it happens, it is a miracle. When you are preaching the gospel, it's not the same thing as giving a TED Talk. It's not the same thing as listening to a life coach. It's not the same thing as a sales pitch. Preaching the gospel isn't even about telling people that they can ask Jesus into their heart. That's a response to the gospel. Preaching the gospel is proclaiming that Christ is Lord behind enemy territory. And, and, that, and that Christ has conquered the domain of darkness by dying for the sins of his people, and he, that he rose from the dead, and that because of this gospel, sinners are called to respond by believing and repenting and confessing of their sins and finding hope and redemption in him. But that response is a miracle. Because whenever the gospel is preached to those in the domain of darkness, it is preached to enemies of Christ. 
What does it mean to be an enemy of Christ? According to Ephesians chapter 2, to be an enemy of Christ is to be dead. Listen, listen to what Ephesians says. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. That's the dominion of darkness, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. What does dead mean in that passage? I looked up the Greek. Do you know what the word dead really means? It means dead. It means dead. There's not another word for it. It's just dead. Necros. If you are dead, are you even able to comprehend the message of the gospel? If you are dead and someone preaches the gospel to you, it would be like trying to teach music to the deaf. It would be like trying to teach color to the blind. It'd be like trying to describe the taste of a bratwurst with sauerkraut on it to a person that doesn't have taste buds, and they look at you and go, that does not sound good. Rotten cabbage? I don't know. And maybe to you, you're like, yeah, I don't think it sounds good either. <laughs> but, but they won't even comprehend it because they don't have taste buds. Have you ever tried describing the taste of honey? Sweet. Well, what does that mean? Well, I can't actually describe it to you. You need to taste it. You need to taste and see that the Lord is good. But you can only do so if you have taste buds. So when Paul looks at the task that he has to preach the gospel, he knows he is not sufficient. He is not sufficient to produce this miracle. He said this in, in a, a Second Corinthians about his lack of sufficiency. He says, who is sufficient for these things? Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. He's not offering sales pitches to come to the gospel. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. No one but the Lord is sufficient for this task. No one but the Lord can make this message go in and cause life. Pastors can preach the gospel all day long, and no matter how perfectly we try to illustrate it, no matter how much we try to get the tone just right, no matter how well-trained we are to make it really artistic and eloquent, no matter how heart-wrenching the stories are that we try to include in our sermon, if the Spirit doesn't open the door and the Word is brought to people by the Spirit to bring them to life from the dead, it will not matter. We need the Lord to open the door. It's like the story of Ezekiel looking out at the dry, dead bones in the valley. And God asks Ezekiel, he says, hey, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel probably looks and goes, I don't, I, you know. He says, you know, Lord. Every single time we look at the world and say, can these bones live? We, don't, we, we, go, we look to God and say, you know, God, you can do it. You can do it. And then what does, Ezekiel, what does God tell Ezekiel? He says, I have something. This is how it's going to work. I'm going to give you a word, and you're going to talk the most weak, nonsensical thing you can imagine for how this is going to happen, right? I'm going to give you words. You're going to talk over these dry bones, and guess what? Flesh is going to sprout around these dry bones. The, the bones are going to start connecting together. Life is going to come out. Did Ezekiel do that? No. It was the power of God at work through the preaching of the word. And every single one of you who believes in Christ, who's trusted in his word, that happened to you. You were dry, dead bones. And Christ, by his grace, worked a miracle in you. And that's why prayer is so important. We need God to do what only he can do. What do you do when that's what you need? You pray. And what do you do? The people of God pray. The people of God pray for the door to be opened to his word, because, and God is glorified to answer those prayers and to move by his spirit to open blind eyes and raise, pray, raise the dead. One more thing regarding the prayer for those who preach God's word. Paul specifically asks the, the Colossians to pray that I may make it clear that this gospel, this mystery of Christ which is how I ought to speak. The preacher's aim is clarity. The pr this is how preachers ought to speak. It's really easy to make your message really ornate with all kinds of things that make it, you know, 
tickle people's ears. But we have a very simple, clear gospel to preach, and that's how preachers ought to preach. If you hear the gospel preached, this truth about Christ preached, and sin and grace are not made clear, that preacher did not preach as he ought to have done. We ought to pray that the glory of Christ in the gospel would be made clear by the clear preaching of the gospel. As Dick Lucas wrote, the revelation of God in Christ has already been given in history and written in scripture, but it must also be spoken by God's servants if people's minds are to be open to the truth. It is by human speech that divine truth is made clear. Now, isn't it wild that God wants to work through us? We're so weak. He's glorified in that weakness. And this, is, this question of clarity is so relevant right now. We are living during a time where we prefer mud to clarity. We want things as unclear as possible so that we can kind of choose our own adventure in every possible way. We're living during a time when there's extreme pressure to obscure the truth of God's word, to avoid what is clearly said in the word in order to get people to listen to what? To a muddy message. Why? Even many Christians prefer the truth to be obscured rather than made clear. In order for the gospel to be made clear, preachers need to speak clearly about the righteousness of God's law. Preachers need to speak clearly about sin, especially where sin is being normalized as good. Preachers need to speak clearly about the love and the grace of God for sinners. Preachers need to speak clearly about the lordship of Christ over all things. Here's one way I think that we, is a very sneaky way that we muddy the message. We do not speak clearly about God's word when we apologize for what it says. You see how that makes it unclear? You're saying, this isn't really good. If the message is the goodness of God is for all people, and that's what, that, that is what satisfies us, God, and then we say, you know what, this thing, I'm sorry that it says that. Do you see how that actually produces an, a muddy message? It doesn't proclaim the goodness. It says, I kind of wish that God wasn't this way. Does that make sense? And when we do that, we are not conveying the, with clarity the goodness of God's word and the goodness of his love that is revealed in that word and the goodness of his righteousness. The love of God is only made clear when we explain that he went to the cross for our sins in order to make us righteous. And God's people as a whole need to speak with clarity and wisdom and answer those outside of Christ as the occasion, occasion arises as well. Which brings me to the last point. Answer the outsider with wisdom. Paul ends his direction in the letter Directing the, by directing the church to walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. One thing I want to point out here is that notice that Paul earlier said, pray for me that I might preach clearly as I ought to speak. And now he's saying, I want you to walk with wisdom so that you might know how you ought to to speak. There is a different circumstances here between these two different groups, the public preacher and the Christian who is going to on occasion meet different people. Underneath this direction is the realism that while not all members are called to the specific ministry of preaching the gospel, they are all called to the, the ministry of evangelism. Preaching the gospel is declarative public speech. I can't adjust what I'm saying to each one of you when I'm up here, okay? But you, while you are out in the world and you are meeting your neighbors as they come to you and as needs arises and God, as God puts people in your life, you are actually able to, with wisdom, discern what needs to be said to each person. Not all believers are called to be preachers, but all are called to be responsive witnesses to those who are outside of Christ, and that's what this part is about. That's mean, that means it's expected that, on, that, that, that occasions will arise where you will need to speak the gospel to outsiders. 
In order to do this, Paul tells us we need to walk in wisdom. What does that mean? To walk in wisdom means understanding and discerning particular situations. It means understanding particular people and how to communicate with them. It means understanding timing and impact. It means understanding that trying to bring up a conversation to witness to your coworker while they're on the phone with the client is probably not the right time. That's not wise. It means having the wisdom to understand when there are people God has put in your life that are ripe for conversation about Christ, and he's calling you to talk to them. It means walking with wisdom towards outsider also means discerning which people God is opening doors to invest in. It also means, because you're limited people, you don't have an infinite amount of time, it also means knowing when God is not calling you to invest your time or where or with who. There is a tendency I want to talk about to assume that walking with wisdom means never making waves, never addressing topics that are contested or that are controversial. In some ways, making waves, in some instances, absolutely making waves like that is not wise. But in others, it may actually be the most wise thing to do. For instance, and I know this is a preaching example, but it illustrates my point, John Knox, who is the Knox that I named my youngest son after of the Scottish Reformation, was known for being a pretty controversial character during his life. But Martin Lloyd-Jones, just an incredibly gentle, awesome, truth-speaking preacher of England, Martin Lloyd-Jones said that he was, John Knox, was a man for his age. A man for his times, a mild man, would have been useless in Scotland. A strong man was needed. Such a man was John Knox, with the fire of God in his bones and and in his belly. He preached as they all preached, with fire and power, alarming sermons, convicting sermons, humbling sermons, converting sermons, and the face of Scotland was changed. Wisdom understands timing. Wisdom understands the times and what is needed for particular situations. For instance, this is another example. Ephesians 5 has a section in it that is very close to this section in Colossians, but it kind of surprises us because it comes after something that we might actually think is contrary to wisdom. Okay, Listen, listen to how Paul calls the church to expose the fruitless deeds of darkness. Listen to this. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That, that needs wisdom. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, what? Expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. And this is, this is the key here. This is the goal. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And then look, look carefully then how you will walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Paul here says, expo- this, by the way, exposing the fruitless deeds of, of darkness, darkness, do you know what that is? That is clearly pointing out evil sin that is rampant in the world and being hidden under, underneath a shroud of darkness. It's easy to see how doing that might actually seem counterproductive and not wise. But the truth is that exposing evil can be the way that God makes the truth visible to outsiders. In some conversations, when you, the Lord is leading you to do something like this, you might be the only person in their life willing to tell them the truth at that time. Exposing darkness, though, does require wisdom. That's why he says, walk with wisdom, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time. It would be absolutely false to say that wisdom will not expose darkness. In fact, it looks, it looks like on this, in this passage in Ephesians that we need wisdom because we must expose darkness. So how do we get wisdom? We learn wisdom from fearing God above all things. We learn wisdom from 
studying his word, and we get wisdom when God gives us wisdom in answer to our prayers. So James calls the church to pray for wisdom. Also, Walking in wisdom means you know you are limited, so you only have so much time. And so Paul tells the people, make the most of the time. One of the implications of that is that you should spend your time where you will have the most impact. Spend your time where it appears that God is preparing the way. Spend your time in prayer, too. That's never a waste of time. Spend your time in prayer that God would give you wisdom and that God would work in your neighbor's lives. He goes on to say, let your speech always be gracious or full of grace. This is the heart of gospel witness. Our speech should flow out of the undeserved favor that Christ gave us when he rescued us from the domain of darkness. And I think it's important to say that there are two temptations we face with this direction. The first is to translate gracious speech as just being nice or just being people pleasers and reserving anything which might be offensive or confrontational. But ask yourself, if we do that, how will you also expose the fruitless deeds of darkness? See how that doesn't work? It's terribly common today to leave people in the darkness out of a fear of offending them or a fear of being branded as a bigot. And not only is that cowardly, it's also truly not loving or gracious. Just like the gospel requires clarity about hard truths, gracious speech does not refrain from speaking the hard truth. But there's another temptation. The second temptation is to ignore the call to be gracious altogether. Do not fall into that pit. Let your, let your speech show truth with love. Our words and deeds should bear the aroma of the grace of God. Even when we need to say the hard and the offensive truth, it should be apparent, like Christ, that our speech is not driven by bitterness, but by a desire to love and welcome our neighbors and enemies to Christ. God was gracious to us when he revealed with clarity our sin problem. God was gracious to us when he revealed with clarity his love and his holiness by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. He was gracious to us when he warned us to repent of sin. Our speech must always be gracious. We ought to always speak and treat outsiders, even if they're hostile to us, with a desire to see them reconciled to God, that they would repent of their sin and be brought into communion with God and his people. The last thing we're told to do is to season our speech with salt. I think this is actually a fun part. What is salt? Okay, People always go like, there's a preservation element. No, this is about seasoning. Why do you put salt on food? Why? To make it taste good, okay? That's the point. Now, given what I told you earlier about how people are saved, does the tasting good part save people? No. The tasting good part is because God is good, All the good things in life are from God. Our words and our speech should taste good. But notice that tasting good can have all kinds of different elements to it. That's why it's kind of fun. You put seasoning on different things and it brings out different flavors. Have you ever put seasoning on or salt on caramel? Changes caramel, but it's still caramel. You're not tasting some other flavor. Salt on steak, you're not tasting salt, you're tasting a salty steak, right? It's updating whatever you're putting it on, which means that that salt is not a one-size-fits-all thing. You are applying salt to different people. That's why Paul says, season with salt so you may know how you ought to answer each person. For instance, to be practical, some conversations with outsiders will benefit with humor, Some will not. Some will benefit with a personal story. Some will not. Some will benefit by sharing your favorite song. Some will not. Some will will indeed benefit by having a philosophical discussion about morality. Some will not. Some, believe it or not, will benefit by having a political discussion. Some will. Some will not. Maybe you're saying, I don't think, I don't know. Some will, maybe many will not. 
This means we need to be students of the people God has put in our life as part of this responsive witness so we might properly season our speech, so we might know how to answer each person. The point of all this direction with our speech towards others is that we would be able to participate in sharing the gospel with those who are outsiders. Why? Because these outsiders are without hope in the world. And because of that, we need to remember above all that we have been brought. We have been brought out of the domain of darkness. We have been transferred into the kingdom of his son by grace and grace alone. This means we have a king who is our Lord, and this king is worthy of every breath and effort in this life. Let's be a people who pray for the door to be opened to the word so our neighbors will be saved. Let's be a people who walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Let's press on in this way because our king is worthy, and he has purchased us by his blood. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your kindness I thank you for your grace which is, and your mercies, which are new every day. Lord, I do pray that we would walk in faithfulness to this word, that you would help us to speak truthfully and, truth, and, and speak with love, that you would help us to season our speech so that it tastes good, not so we can manipulate people, but because you are good and worthy of that seasoning. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do this and that you would be glorified in us. In the name we pray, amen.